So, um, as Andrew said, my name is Chris. Uh, I've uh, been working in this industry since the mid-90s, so quite a long time. Uh, started off heavy systems administration background, had the great uh, opportunity in my career to start coming to the Lisa conference around 2005, which uh, if anyone uh, knows that history, there was a bit of a kind of revolution going on in the configuration management space. That was when a lot of um, kind of the current gen of tools were just uh, fledgling baby tools. That was when Puppet was first uh, coming out. That was when Chef was first coming out. That was when CF Engine was trying to catch up uh, and move from version two to ver version three. And uh, I really drunk the configuration management Kool-Aid uh, and infrastructure automation Kool-Aid uh, very deeply. Worked uh, for a couple of Web 2.0 social media companies here in California. Dealt with a lot of very uh, high scale high availability environments to keep everything up and running. And I also have most recently in the last few years added a uh, somewhat of an evangelist advocacy uh, kind of role to my career uh, as a speaker at conferences and helping to uh, grow the systems administration and SRE community uh, and, and add my voice to that uh, discussion that's been going on. Uh, to give you a bit of a background of me and my, my company and kind of why I'm up here talking about SRE hiring, I hire people. Uh, I was brought in a few years ago to kind of reboot our systems administration practice at Pythian. One of the challenges exactly like was outlined in the keynote, a systems administrator could be anything from the guy who helps you out and fixes your printer jam all the way up to the guys running Google and everything in between. Uh, we went through a very similar title change to kind of take that back uh, as an intermediate step and we've uh, a few years ago decided to really kind of put ourselves in alignment with where we feel things are going with SRE as a very large industry trend. I've had a very unique uh, experience taking what was predominantly a group of operational systems administrators and trying to uh, move them more towards the SRE philosophy and uh, skill set, uh, while at the same time building out new teams. Uh, I've hired about 30 people in the last two years, and this year we're looking at 100% growth on that as well. So. Uh, in short, I hire a lot of people. Uh, to the point where I was actually pulled off of managing a direct team to focus on hiring as my full-time goal. Uh, one of the neat things about doing that is I got to really take a look at hiring in an evolutionary point of view, looking at hiring then versus hiring now. Uh, and I got to work with our HR team to, uh, to evolve our process to ensure that it was measurable at all stages and to uh, to take a deep look at it and and see where things have been going. And it's pretty clear that there's kind of been a shift going on in the industry that's been fundamentally changing what we're looking for in people. Uh, you know, if we take a look back at a then versus now, uh, I think it will pretty much outline things. So then versus now. So I, I look at hiring then as the trivia game show. So back in the day, you asked a lot of technical questions, and they, people would regurgitate those answers, and, and you go, wow, this guy, person, this guy knows a lot of stuff, so we're going to hire him. Uh, you know, Job descriptions and job recs were basically a big jumble of technological soup. It was just acronyms, this, that, the other thing. And the kind of conventional wisdom was, you, you put everything on that resume, or not everything on the resume, you put everything on that job description under the sun, and then you kind of settle for the guy who kind of comes in at the 70 or 80% of stuff. Uh, and, and I don't think that really works well, because you know the game show model kind of re rewards regurgitation. It kind of rewarded the right answer, not necessarily the thought process on how to get to that answer. And it really focused on what you know today. Uh, 
and I think, you know, for, for a period of time, that was okay because things were kind of very stable, you know, from, I'd say, the mid-90s and uh, for the next, you know, 10 years or so. Things were pretty stable. Things kind of stayed the same. So you could kind of hire people who knew the most, and, and then you'd get a great hire out of that person. But right now, we're at the intersection of old versus new. And it's really interesting because you can see that uh, when you're starting to get answers back to people from people uh, when you're talking to people on these interviews, and and it, and it's really interesting uh, to see the future of the way things are going. And a lot of it talks about at scale, right? So, you know, pretty typical question you could ask like a systems administrator type person. You know, back in the day, how do I add an IP address to ETH1 on a Red Hat kind of family, whatever box, Red Hat, CentOS, Amazon. Uh, and, and, and you'd probably get something like this. I know there's probably like 15 other options you could possibly put in there, but those are kind of your core options. And you'd look at that and go, okay, so the guy's, you know, guy knows to go into Etsy sysconfig network scripts, if config ETH1, plumb all the interface, that means it'll come up when it reboots. Okay, that guy knows what he's doing. Uh, but today, you're just as likely to get an answer that looks like this. You're going to get three lines of code that in, in a config management language. This happens to be Puppet, uh, but it could be anything. It could be Puppet, it could be Chef, it could be Ansible, it could be Salt. And, and, and you're sitting here going, well, is, is, which is, is one answer better than the other? Like, is one person more right? And, and that comes down to a real personal uh, evaluation of where your business is right now. Like, if your business is stuck in the, in the olden days where you're, you're, you're going on every box to make every change, then, you know, uh, perhaps the, 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 the first candidate is more appealing to you. If you want to move that business into something where there's more automation, then perhaps the second candidate is more appealing to you. Or if you're already there, then perhaps this, the first candidate who did not give you the config management answer is not the right candidate for you. Uh, what's more interesting is that as we continue to grow uh, in the industry, and as we continue to push out to the point where all, cus all clients are looking at highly scalable environments, uh, you couldn't even get to the point where the person who gives you this second answer wouldn't even know how to do the first answer and then the larger question becomes, is that good? Does it matter? Does it matter that the person doesn't know to edit Etsy sysconfig network scripts if config eth1, if that person's never going to be doing that? So back in the day, you'd have an outage, your web server would go down, and it would be panic on the floor. People would be running around with their arms flailing, going, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Every executive would come out of the office and find where you are. They never come into the systems administration uh, area of the office before, and they would find it. And they, they, they would come in and they would go, what's going on? Our site is down, we're losing money. And we would put on our, our capes and our cowboy hats, and we would work tirelessly to get that system back up and running. And, you know, and then, and then scarily enough, we would be rewarded for getting the box back up rather than building the fireproof house. Uh, whereas today, we have more resilient architecture, which is hopefully being used. Uh, you have a load balancer pool, you have a bunch of web servers in that load balancer pool, one of those boxes goes down or starts acting different. If you've, if you've really put your investment into your infrastructure, into building out your tools, then you're probably not even getting paged because it's just one box. You're going to just, you know, you're just going to, or if you get paged, you're just going to terminate the instance and let your entire system bring a new node back into the cluster, run through all your tests, and then start serving at traffic when it's ready to go. Uh, if 90% of your pool is acting the way you want it and one or two boxes aren't, you're not necessarily going to be investing a lot of time or effort or emotion into figuring out what's wrong with those couple of boxes. And because of the ability to scale and toss things behind load balancers and all of that, the business isn't uh, willing to 
willing to invest the time or money into that type of troubleshooting that we used to in the past. It kind of, I kind of call it cattle, not cats. So in the old days, our systems were unique. They were, you know, highly customized by hand. We invested a lot of time in them. There was very little automation. Chances are we had an install doc or a wiki that maybe encapsulated most of what would be needed to hopefully maybe be able to bring that box back if something were to blow up. Which is why if the box went down, we invested so much time and effort and energy into getting that box back up. Uh, because if we had to replace the box, chances are we wouldn't be able to do it. We wouldn't be able to do it in the same way, or we'd be looking at a long re restore off of our backup system. Our, everyone who's, who's done this a long time probably can remember a server, ser server or two that they treated more like a pet than they did uh, like a server, and that they spent long hours and invested a lot of time and effort and pride into, and they become emotionally attached to the server, and they start treating them like cats, like pets. And, and that's not good, because no one wants to put a bullet in Mr. Fluffy's head. But the reality is, we've shifted. We need to start treating our server environments like cattle. And so you have a, homo a homogenized group of systems that are kind of doing all the same thing. They're highly, uh, highly available, and they're highly customized, but not on the box that's done in your configuration management or your environmental provisioning systems you spend a lot of time getting that model right, but you don't really spend a lot of time on the boxes, so you don't have that emotional attachment. If something's going wrong, if a box is acting weird, you shoot it in the head, you make hamburger, and you move on. Uh, and you know, you're not necessarily even troubleshooting the environment uh, like you would back in the olden days. So you're starting to see this really interesting intersection between candidates where people who've been working for, for the older days kind of still have a lot of that cat mentality in their head, and the younger generation that's coming out often have the cattle mentality in their head, uh, which may or may not be the case depending on you know each person's experience, but we're at a really interesting intersection right now between kind of cattle and cats. Uh, and depending on what's right for your business or where you want to go, that is kind of the direction that you're going to take. But you know, technology isn't the problem. And I, I was really happy uh, and relieved when I was in Andrew's talk earlier on SRE hiring, uh, and he focused a lot on the technology side, because that's not what I'm going to focus on, because I don't think it's the problem here. And why? Well, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you're going to get the cattle or the cat's answer. It doesn't matter if you're going to get the if config answer or you're going to get the puppet answer. A lot of that technical stuff is still very easy to measure, it's very easy to quantify, it's very easy to tell whether or not someone got the right or wrong answer. With the caveat that they may or may not be getting the right or wrong answer for your business at that point in time in your business's growth. You know, the puppet guy got the right answer, but if you are not using any config management, and if you have no plan to use config management, then that might not be the right candidate for you. Or on the flip side, if config man got the right answer, but if you're you know, a puppet shop or a chef shop and you have a thousand nodes, you're like, dude, you are not going to box walk to add an interface to a thousand servers. You're going to do it through config management. So that's great. So what is the problem? And I have to just toss up this next slide. I think it really sums it up perfectly. So the problem is, and, the, and I think the problem is outlined perfectly in the middle panel, is that how does anything that we've been doing in our career up to this date help us prepare for the fact that technology is growing and changing and evolving so quickly that anything we've done in the past doesn't necessarily, uh, does not necessarily ready us for what we're going to need to do in the future? And I took a look at the hiring to date and did a bit of a root cause analysis. So the current method kind of really tests what you know. But the problem is, is what you know is really losing value to employers. What you were doing in your career 15, 10, or even five years ago is not the way that we do things anymore. And it's definitely not the way that things are going to be done moving forward. The change and the focus, I find, has moved into 
soft skills and traits. And I hate to say it, because with soft skills and traits, the hippies have won. So you take something that 10 years ago when I was looking at a candidate, and I'm saying, OK, well, I need someone who knows Apache, and I need someone who knows PHP, and I need someone who knows Memcache, and I need someone who has worked with CDNs, and I need someone who can kick around MySQL good enough uh, in case there's some problems. And those are all check boxes, right? But how do we do this whole like ability to learn new things quickly? And uh, you know, how do we do logical thinking? And how do we wrap all of that around uh, something that is measurable and something that you can compare two candidates against? Uh, my company does consulting both on the SRE systems administration, networking, DevOps side, as well as database uh, practices in Oracle, MySQL, MS, SQL, and open source database technologies. And I had a great opportunity to sit down with some of my colleagues, some of the other people who are in charge of hiring, and I said, guys, when you're doing a fit interview, how far in until you know whether or not you're going to hire the person or not? And the, the answer I got was nearly identical and incredibly disturbing. And the people were like, oh, you know, I generally know in the first five minutes whether or not the person is a good fit and whether or not I should hire that person. And I went, what? Five minutes? You spend five minutes with the guy and, and, and you're like, yeah, that guy's a good guy. We're going to, yeah, I think he's, he'd do well for the role. Uh, one thing to note about our process is we separate our technical evaluation from our uh, fit evaluation, team fit, man, uh, culture fit evaluation. Uh, so they've already been evaluated as having the technical skills required to do the job when they go for fit interview. So uh, you can you can let a little bit go there and say they don't have uh, the people doing our fit interview don't have to worry about evaluating technology alignment or technical skill. But it's still really disturbing to think that oh I you know I spent uh, five minutes talking to the guy I think he's pretty good you know. Let's hire them. You know, we're SREs. We love data. We love metrics. We need something better than that. Hiring on gut alone, well, I think it's the equivalent of basically saying, have you tried turning it on and off again? You know, you know the reboot's going to work, but you don't know why. And, and, and when I really called some of my colleagues on it, they kind of agreed. They kind of put their head down in kind of shame and and they said well well how do you take all of these soft traits these soft skills how do you how do you get data out of that how do you how do you do that how do you measure that and they said you know the problem is is that you know you take a job description from a few years ago and like i said it was a very large list list of very easy to measure technical requirements a job description today you know it 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 reads like this it says i'm looking for a person with great self awareness the ability to handle stress well and who can learn new things quickly someone who is risk aware but not afraid to take risks i mean all you need to do to add to that is enjoy romantic walks on the beach and you feel like you should be hiring someone off of okcupid instead of linkedin so I just said no. Just no. We have to take it back. You know, we can't be hiring on gut alone. We can't be, you know, if we have to work with these traits, and get, don't get me wrong, you know, I think this is absolutely right. I think it is absolutely easier to teach someone something technical if they have the proper foundations in a much quicker time than it is to break habits, form new habits, and learn new non-technical skills. So a lot of our focus in hiring is making sure we hit on the highest level possible on the non-technical traits. Because I can take someone, I can send them out on a Python course if they need better Python. I can tell them to take a week and learn Elasticsearch and at the end of it come out with these skills so that you can support 80% of the, 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 the things that are going to pop up in our Elasticsearch environment. I can do that. Uh, with most of the people that we hire. I can work with technical gaps, but gaps on the soft skills skill side are really, really hard to fill because they take a long time to develop and they take a long time to break if it's a bad habit. And what it comes down to is we really need to understand what the cost of hiring is. So we need to understand the cost of getting a butt into the seat. And you know, we have to understand what the cost of parting ways is as well. And we have to remember that 
finding that new person also includes the cost of finding all of the people of, of disqualifying all of the people who did not match. And then we have to have a way to measure all of that at every stage so that we can improve the process, lower the costs, and improve that hit rate. So at my company, because we're a company that is remote, we bring everyone to our head office in Ottawa for three weeks uh, from wherever they are hired in the world to immerse themselves in our corporate culture, understand our policies, meet with the team managers who are also flown in uh, to, to participate in their onboarding. And if we make a bad people decision, we're walking away from a significant amount of money. But the amount of money that we're walking away from is pales in comparison with keeping a, keeping, an, keeping a person who is not a good fit, either from a technical point of view or from a, from a team culture point of view, uh, employed with you. You know, you have, to, you have to take into consideration you're not going to be perfect, uh, but you need, to, you, know, you need to have people leave the process and, and unfortunately leave the company uh, at an appropriate time. And, but it, it's a real pressure because you can invest a lot of money into someone just to get their butt into the seat before they've even worked a single minute for you. And with this new, uh, new hiring shift towards the soft skills, where at least at my company we really hadn't cracked the nut of how to measure potential and uh, all of the all of these soft skills that we're looking for, you know, self-awareness. We need someone who will put their hand up after working on a challenge for a little while and say, I need some help. Uh, you know, we need people who, again, are risk averse, but at the same time, not afraid to try new things. We need people who uh, can work and learn new techn technologies quickly. And, you know, we need people who have, uh, who have great organizational and time management skills because we have to, you know, bill our clients and track our time properly. Uh, and in fact, you know, we, we, we have more weight on, on the soft skills requirements than the technical skill requirements. So, so what are we going to do? We need to kind of take this back. And it's pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to apply our SRE principles to hiring. And we're going to do data-driven hiring, a.k.a. we're going to make every hire count, a.k.a. we're going to take the woo-woo out of hiring. We're going to demystify that entire soft skill side of the interviewing process. You know, on the one hand, we have the technical side that we have the yin, and we have something that we've been doing for a long time. And we understand how to measure that. The other side of it, we have all of this stuff that we don't really have a good way to measure. So, so we started off with this, but we really want to end up with like this. This is, you know, the new reality. Well, we're pining for the days when we were able to hire this. You know, that, that guy who is really technical, but just don't let him talk to anybody. Just put him in that corner and let him do his thing. You know, that a good old highly technical bastard operator from hell. I completely agree uh, with, with uh, the people who have said it already today. That is dying and going the way of the dinosaur. We don't have that luxury anymore. One of the biggest challenges is that a lot of the people who are the hire man hiring managers we're, we're, that, we're that old guy hitting people with the modems. <laughs> we're, we're that guy who's been in the industry for 20 years, and, and we're like, we have 30 years of experience, and, and, and we're trying to deal with all of these technologies that we've never heard of and that are changing every two weeks because it allows someone to increase their velocity or uh, decrease their you know, cycle time or something like that by like an extra two or three, so everyone's now jumping the bandwagon. You know, I was on a call you know, I was on a call, it's, it's about six months ago, I was on a call with one of our clients and they're like, yeah, you know, Node.js is really kind of old and we're not really comfortable using it anymore. It's pretty, you know, old. So we're going to move to this thing called Vertex. I'm like, Google, Vertex. Okay, no problem. And yeah, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do that over the next couple of iterations and then we're going to need your help supporting the environment that's going to be running under Vertex. Oh, and, and we're getting rid of Unicorn too because Unicorn is not really helping us out anymore. We're going to move to Puma. I'm like, okay, Google, Google Puma. Okay, what's, okay, yeah, no problem. Great, thank you. And I call up my principal consultant. I'm like, Bill, have you ever heard of Puma and Vertex? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, good, because we have to support it in a couple of weeks. He's like, oh, great. Uh, but that's it. The technology is moving and changing. And, and, and it, I think it's that software engineering kind of attitude that's kind of that's kind of taking hold in, in the industry that, you know, we're going to work with the tool 
that gives us the most advantage and we will use our skills to kind of overcome the shortcomings of that tool or overcome the fact that uh, there's, there's not a lot of documentation or anything like that uh, with the tool. It's that intersection that Ben Trainer talked about last year of uh, this, the systems administrator's goal is stability and reliability and, and no change and the software engineer's goal is, is a lot of change and, and rapid change and quick change. So, uh, so we have to understand that the people who are hiring Unless you're really lucky and 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 you you're very close to this generation of technology, where are the where are those old guys hitting people with the modems? And as I mentioned before, to get there, we need to measure all the things. We absolutely need to have a way to take these soft skills, figure out how to rate them, scale them, uh, compare them and then get us some data to back up those gut feelings. Because gut feelings are important. I'm not going to downplay that at all. The, the gut feeling you have about a person is, is important in the hiring decision, uh, but you need data to back that up, especially if you're comparing multiple candidates against each other. So what it comes down to is you need to define traits. So you have to understand your wants and your needs, and you can't have a hundred traits. So you have to go, okay, well, what's important to me? Just like in technology, well, what's important to me? You know, if, you know, you, if, if you're doing SRE and DevOps uh, type of integrated work, you need someone who has strong coding skills. You know, uh, kicking some things around in Bash isn't necessarily going to cut it today. Uh, you know, if you're using, if you're using Unicorn or using uh, Puma or using any of those type of, of web servers or frameworks, you're going to need someone who understands those, not a guy who only uh, only has been touching Apache for the last 20 years. Uh, so you need to sit there and you need to talk about what are the soft skills that we need. You know, I agree, the bastard operator from hell is, is something that it needs to go away. So you need someone who has that customer service mindset, understands that there are internal customers. Uh, and then this is going to be tailored to your 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 particular environment. I'm a I'm a hiring manager of consultants, so I have to take into consideration the fact that everybody I hire needs to be able to uh, be put in front of clients, and they need to be able to talk to our clients. So that's a very high trait on my list. I also don't have time to micromanage anyone. I have more than enough work to do myself. So time management is a very high. Uh, trait on my skill list. In fact, it was really interesting. Two years ago at Lisa in Washington, D.C., I went to one of Tom Lumincelli's time management uh, lectures, and afterwards I said, Tom, I said, so I'm having this problem right now, and I have all my guys, and I have these guys, and it's like herding cats, and I can't ever get them to finish a project on time and give me something and hit these deliverables, and what do I do? Like, do I buy everyone a copy of your book or, and, and sit them down and say, read this book? And he's like, well, you know, I'd, I'd really, you know, appreciate that. And my publishers would really appreciate that, but it's not going to get you what you want. He goes, what it comes down to is you have to hire people who have good time management skills. And I went, oh, of course, hire people who have two good time management skills. What I didn't understand at the time is what Tom was saying is, you have to identify that as a trait in a person that's important to you and your organization. And then you have to basically identify it as a need and say, I'm not going to compromise on this. If that person doesn't have good time management skills, it's a deal breaker. I'm not going to hire them. So what you have to do is you have to kind of identify your traits. What's important to you non-technically? You know, we all, you, you've pro I could ask you what's important to you technically. You could probably ramble that off the top of your head. But sit down and put some thoughts into what's important to you from a non-technical point of view in a person. And then what we need to do is we need to assign weights to those traits. So you have to have a weight because you can't have all of the traits being at the same weight. The, the actual you know, word priority up until when it, was first, when it was first started to be used was singular. There was no such thing as multiple priorities. Priority meant the most important thing. And it was about 500 years later when they actually started pluralizing priority into the plural, priorities. And I think part of the challenge is, is once they did that, we started making millimeters of progress in millions of different, of different directions instead of a lot of progress in one direction when we were working with a single priority. 
But, you know, priorities are kind of here to stay. I'm not here to try and fight the power on that one. But you've got to identify your priorities and then weight them. You know, some of the work we do, we don't do hands-on data center racking and stacking, right? So, like, that doesn't even make my list of priorities on the technical side. But if it did for some reason, if changing RAM and swapping power supplies and making sure you got the right amount of thermal goo on your CPU before you put your heat sink on was a priority to me, it would be a low one compared to some of the other work we're doing. So the same holds true with your soft traits. You have to take your soft traits and say, what's my most important thing? Well, for me, my most important thing is instilling that level of confidence inside in, in to our clients that you know, if a client is calling us up at two in the morning and something is blown up, that they feel like they're getting the rock star on the phone that's going to say, no problem, I'm going to get everything up and running, and then is able to communicate with that client properly. You know, after that, like I said, time management, a very important pri priority for me. We have to track our time, we have to bill our clients, and we have to deliver. And I can't, as a manager, be sitting over your shoulder, nor would anyone who is working for me want me to do that for very long. And then you have to understand that unicorns are rare, right? Because you can find those people that have it all, but they're few and far between. So you have to understand that you can have someone who's a five in every single category, but chances are you're not going to find that person. And then even if they're a five in your, uh, your trait that's rated the lowest, it's still a weighted answer and a weighted score. So then what you do from there, or what we did from there, is we looked at supporting questions that don't suck. So you have to take your traits and you have to say, okay, well, I'm, I want to create these questions that will allow me to learn that about the person I'm interviewing. And I think it's really important that you need to you know, put some time into these questions because this is where you're gonna, you're gonna get your data. This is where you're gonna get a lot of the information out in the interviewing process. And like, like Andrew said in his talk, you know, you don't wanna be reading from a script because everyone knows that, everyone knows that. Everyone knows the, those, I can say right now, everyone knows those HR questions that you know it's almost like there's some rule that they have to ask those questions. And those are questions that suck. And if I'm interviewing someone, I want to be able to have awesome questions because I'm the one who has to go through hundreds of interviews to find the person. I also want to have a great interviewing process for the person who is going through that because that person you know, might not be a good fit for our organization right now, but six months down the road, a year down the road, they might absolutely be a great fit. You, you know, this whole process is basically trying to figure out if you guys are on the same page or not. And if you're not on the same page, then it could easily be that you'll be on the same page down the road. So I want to have people leave our hiring process thinking, wow, that was a really great hiring process. Those were really great questions. It was really challenging. And, you know, this is probably a really great place to work. I want to go off and do some work on the areas they told me to work on and come back and apply again. Or I want to pipeline someone, I want to keep them warm, and I want to check in on where they are six months down the road or a year down the road. So you need to have questions that don't suck. And, you know, no questions that you can Google. <laughs> There's so many, I see it on LinkedIn all the time in my feed, you know, the, the common answers to the top five interview questions and how to answer the, how have you made a mistake in your career question and you know no so I, I purposefully kind of find my questions as like you know the deconstructed antithesis to those I'm like no if if it's out there and there's an answer to it I'm trying to find something that asks the same question in a different way and even have more than one question obviously that asks that talks about the same trait that's just asking it in a little different direction because you know they, you know everyone's smart that we're trying to hire, hopefully, and, and they can go. Oh, this is they want they want they want to hear about my, you know, my ability to handle stress, and so they're going to try and give you the answer you're looking for. But try and find sneaky questions, sneaky questions that can give you those same answers, but without uh, tipping the person off as to what the trade it's looking for. So then we're going to put it all together. 
So you have to have like an interviewing scorecard. So you're going to rank your category, your, your, your candidate in each category, and you're going to evaluate them. You're going to have your notes, and you're going to give them a score. So the, the ranking score times the weight of that trait equals the overall score or for that category. And then the sum of the score from each category gives you kind of an overall rate for the candidate. And we now have data. So you can now compare candidates to one, one another on the categorical level, and you can compare them on the overall level. And now we have that data to back up that gut feeling so we're not making hiring decisions based on the first five minutes of meeting a person either in person or over a Google Hangout or, or whatever uh, method we're using. So we've essentially, we've achieved victory, which is really awesome. So now we have some balance again in our process. We have a technical process that we can, that we can measure. We have data from that process. We can compare candidates on their technical merits. We now have a process that allows us to do the same on these, you know, tree-hugging, hippie, chia-eating, electric car-driving, soft-skill things, which is really great. Uh, one last point I wanted to put in, because I think it's very important, but I think it's almost an entire talk on its own, is successful hiring is really only half that story. The care and feeding of your SRE team is really important as well. Seeds don't grow unless they're given the right environment. You can't generally just chuck some seeds down into the dirt and hope that you're going to get a tree that bears fruit. You have to make sure that the environment is right. You have to make sure you have the right soil, the right amount of water, the right amount of sunlight, the right fertilizer and food, and you have to take care of providing the right environment so that your seeds can grow and return what you're looking for. A, hire, a team is, is no different. You can't just hire a team of people and go poof, SRE, and expect it to work because you need to have that buy-in from all the different levels of leadership in your company. You have to have the buy-in from all the different managers and you have to really create that environment so that everyone can grow and be successful because if you don't, then you're just not going to get what you want out of the people you hired. SRE, just hiring an SRE alone isn't going to magically solve everything, usually. So why well, yes, we are hiring. Uh, if you are interested in that, come and talk to me uh, later on. Uh, but without any uh, further ado, are there any questions? Please use the microphone. <laughs> So one question I have is, could you go over what you look for in, say, a junior SRE? Sure. I look for a lot of the same things, but I have just a different level of expectation. I look for, this, I look for a seedling as opposed to a tree. So, but I'm still looking for the same things. I'm still looking for the, the foundation of personality and passion and customer service skills and time management skills and generally being an organized person. And I'm, my expectation is that they will be less developed than in uh, like a, a intermediate or senior kind of SRE role. But I still need the same things. At the junior level, there is a little more flexibility for gaps. Uh, but at the same time, you still have to take into consideration the amount of investment in filling that gap versus uh, moving on to another candidate that might have that, uh, that trait already in place. Again, uh, my focus is more as a hiring manager is more on the non-technical side. Uh, so, you know, technical skill gaps are, are another, another concern as well. Uh, but on the trait side, I think a lot of the traits that we have are not necessarily traits that we, you know, that we, we learn on the job. I think they're traits that we've developed throughout our lives. So, you know, getting someone kind of out of grad school or college versus someone who's been in the industry for a long time, my expectation would be that uh, that I would be looking for the same traits, just at a different level of maturity in, in a junior role versus a senior role. Uh, 
Hi. Uh, I was wondering, how do you give how do you give any kind of feedback on these traits to the potential candidates that don't pass and do pass the interviews with you? Uh, how do you give them, and what kind of feedback that is? Sure. So, uh, like I said, we have a pretty good uh, open policy on what our process is. So everyone coming into our hiring process is, is told these are the various stages of the process. Uh, and then generally when we exit the process, uh, you know, again, we try, and, we try and give a little bit of feedback uh, to help them, you know, understand why we, we were passing on them. Sometimes if it's, if it's just such a clear no, uh, I'll be fairly honest, I kind of leave that in the hands of our HR team on, on how to, uh, how to talk to the client uh, that route. Uh, if it's someone who I am genuinely interested in keeping an eye on, or who I would genu genuinely want to come back uh, to us, I'm very honest about it. If I say, look, I would love to see you come back in six months to a year, and this is what I would like to see improved in that period of time, then it just comes down to whether or not that person is eager to uh, go off and do the work. And, and it's, it's clear. I'll say, look, you know, we're, we have a responsibility to time track to the minute because that's how we bill our clients. And, you know, it does add some stress into the environment. And right now, uh, right now, you're not demonstrating that you have very good uh, skills in stress management. I don't think that would make you very successful here. Here's some exam Here's some things that you can work on uh, to try and and strengthen those skills. Uh, I've had it work very successfully, where I've had people go away and uh, come back, and it's you can. We have the data from the first set of interviews. We put them through the second set of interviews. We can see that progress and. We've said, okay, look, this person got, went off and learned uh, and has, has shown that they've planted the seeds in that area where they were lacking. And now that they have those seeds and that foundation, we can really help grow that with them. Um, you said that you value time management as a skill, but how do you interview for that? <laughs> so it's tricky. Uh, you have to you have to ask a lot of questions about how a person uh, how a person organizes their day and their time, what tools they use. Um, you know, like you know, how do you you know how do you plan your day? Right, that's a great question. And if someone just says, "I show up for work and I deal with whatever fire is on." then you have to kind of steer it a different way because you're not getting any indication as to whether or not the person has any of those skills. But if they're like, you know, oh, you know, at the end of the day, I'll check my calendar for the next day, and, you know, I use some app, any do, to do, just the default to do, or even use my calendar uh, to plan out time. I block off time so that I can catch up Catch up blocks are a great thing. You know, look at your calendar and just know that, you know, maybe I'm going to block an hour between three and four just so I can catch up on stuff so I can finish my day at five. You know, if they start giving you answers like that, if they're doing anything like that, then you can go, okay, well, this person seems very well organized and they seem to be able to track time. That also starts talking about their ability to handle stress because. If they're organized, then hopefully stress will be something they can handle better. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and so it just gets into understanding what questions you can ask that will reinforce or answer the questions of the traits that you've defined as a need. And, and then weighting those. So, you know, maybe time management isn't your hugest priority. So for me, it's like a four. For you, it might be a two. But it's still kind of one of your top five traits, right? You have to limit that. You have to kind of say, I don't, I can't hire a hundred traits. 
I can't, you know, finding that unicorn is just not going to happen. But these are the must-haves, needs versus wants. What are your needs? So if you need time management, if that is a deal breaker, then that's like a five on your waiting. And something that's a want, like, you know, I, would, I want someone who, you know, who, I don't know, enjoys beach volleyball. It's just a weird one, but that's a, it's a want, it's a one. I don't know why that would make your top five, but maybe you have a really killer beach volleyball team at your, at your company. Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's what you do, right, is you, is you weight those appropriately. So, so you're not having arguments with people going, well, this guy's a killer beach volleyball player, but he has horrible time management skills. So if you score the guy a five in beach volleyball, that was weighted a one. Overall, he's still only getting a five there. But if you, your, your time management is your number five from the weighted score and he only has a one there, he's still only getting five on that time management uh, out of 25, which is, which is a lot worse than a five out of five on a, on a one weighted question. So by weighting the questions, you avoid a lot of arguments. We had a big problem where we were really like networking, 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 networking. And it's really, you know, networking is really important and you need to understand all of that. But uh, it, there was no weighting to that. And it was, it was weak, people with weak networking were becoming these great long debates, whereas People with, you know, with whereas they'd have strong skills in config management and they'd have strong skills in, you know, like clustering and scaling and all that type of stuff or cloud, and and they would score weak on their on their networking and we're like, we don't do a lot of networking. <laughs> it's not like on the top. It's on the top five list of the work that comes in. It's it's very low for our business. You know, your business might be more networking centric, obviously, and networking might be a five for you. But we, we had to apply that weighted average there so that we could say networking is a two and config management is a five and scripting is a four, you know? So, so that if someone scored strong on networking but weak on the other ones, overall they would show that as being weak. Without weighting them, it was really difficult to show the weakness and the strengths in a candidate. Awesome, well thank you very much and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your conference and it's been a great honor to be able to speak in front of you guys. Thank you. And if anyone has any other questions or wants to talk, I'm gonna ju I'll just be hanging around uh, and I hope to see you guys later.